over the last month, and particularly this last week and last several days, we have been bombarded about messages about Halloween. And as much as we've been bombarded with messaging about Halloween, there's just as many opinions about how Christians should view Halloween, whether we should uh, not celebrate it at all because it is a, a, a evil pagan holiday, whether there are parts of it that we can uh, celebrate and, and others that we can discard, or whether it's uh, simply a uh, an okay um, celebration and, and it has uh, no uh, parts that, that we have to particularly worry about as Christians. So here's where I'm going to put on my history cap. Um, Halloween comes from uh, the word All Hallows Evening. Um, the, the day of All Hallows or All Saints Day uh, is, is uh, celebrated by the Catholic Church and many Protestant churches on November 1st. And the day before that would be October uh, 31st uh, in our calendars. And so uh, All Hallows Even or All Hallows Eve uh, eventually uh, gets jumbled into All Hallows Even and then All Halloween and then just drop the all and it becomes Halloween. This day of All Saints Day or All Hallows Day um, is celebrated at around the same time that the usual harvest celebration would be celebrated by the pagan cultures um, in the West. Uh, there, there was always a, a celebration uh, of, of those pagan uh, tribes sometime uh, around the end of uh, the summer season, summer growing season, and before the first uh, killing frost of winter to celebrate uh, the bounty of the harvest. Um, and uh, particularly in the, in the British Isles, we, we uh, know uh, a lot of this uh, celebration is where we get a lot of our Halloween rituals from uh, because th this harvest festival was called uh, Samhain and, and uh, some of those same rituals get mixed into what we know of as Halloween. Um, and the reason that we get Halloween at this time is not completely coincidental. Um, the quickest and uh, most usual way for the church to decide on feast days uh, in the calendar was to find a feast day or, or a day when everybody was already celebrating uh, in, in the predominant um, non-believing culture um, and, and just uh, take a sharpie and mark out in the calendar and change, change the name of the pagan celebration to a church name and attempt to redeem or sanctify that day. Uh, we see the same thing happen uh, right around the winter solstice and the vernal equinox with the celebrations of Christmas and Easter by the church. Just celebrate uh, a church holiday right around the same time that everybody else is already celebrating and attempt to redeem uh, that particular holiday. And so we, we see that this is where we get uh, our Halloween uh, timetable. Um, now as Halloween became uh, more and more the holiday, and All Saints Day became less and less the focus, this is where we get uh, the challenge for us as Christians. Now, I would venture to say that most of what we know of as Halloween has become much more worldly. It's not exactly Christian, and it's not exactly the pagan beliefs. It's neither one. Um, and so it's just a holiday that has become more worldly. And as with any of our life, without the proper faith instruction, we can always become more worldly. Our celebrations become more worldly. This is in fact why we have to be reminded to stay close to the foundations of our faith and particularly to the teachings of those saints who have taught uh, us before. Those uh, saints, whether canonized officially by the church or those own personal saints that have taught us in the faith, we remember those saints who have passed on and the lessons they have taught us in the faith that we might not be so caught up in the worldliness that we tend to default to uh, if we're not paying attention carefully enough. And we are thankful for that foundation of faith. The, the central uh, tenet or the central part of that foundation is that we who were once enemies 
uh, we who were once in darkness have been saved and redeemed uh, by Jesus Christ. And so we celebrate uh, that um, as often as we can uh, to try to keep us from falling into the trap of worldliness. In today's passage in Revelation, John sees a vision or a mini revelation about a large multitude of people worshiping and celebrating all that God has done. Now this this picture is uh, a large crowd more than we can imagine. The numbers are more than the billions and trillions of people that, that maybe we can think of. It, the number is approaching infinity. Think of all the largest crowds we've seen from recent presidential inaugurations to maybe World Series parades of, of teams like uh, the Cubs who not who had not won a World Series in over 100 years, or, or any other large gathering that we have seen in particular, all of them put together um, are less than the number that John sees in today's passage in Revelation. As John observes this, the angel who has been guiding him through in this chapter asks John rhetorically, who are these people? And then this same angel responds to his own question and tells John, they are the ones who have been loyal to Jesus through the Great Tribulation. Now we can get into a, a theological debate over when the tribulation occurs and who is saved and who isn't and whether it's a post-tribulation or, or mid-tribulation or pre-tribulation rapture. But regardless uh, of all of those views, uh, this is where I'll take the Wesleyan tact and say, it is important that there is tribulation. It is important that there are those whose uh, sacrifice at some point around the tribulation, whether pre, mid, or after the tribulation, are saved by the blood um, of Jesus Christ as they have died. Um, sometime around the tribulation, they are cleansed by the blood and they get white robes. Now, a lot of us read that and we go, well, that's, that's not how laundry works. You know, if we're wearing a white t-shirt and we get blood on it, um, that t-shirt is not clean. It needs to be cleaned up. It is stained with blood. And so if it is, we usually have to take some shout and, and, and uh, pre-treat it and then throw it in some bleach uh, in the washing machine and then try to get it back to its, its white and hope that that blood comes out. But in the Bible, blood cleanses and makes the robes white, at least in today's passage in Revelation. Blood plays an important part in our lives and particularly in the Bible. Blood is important. It's pumped from our heart into the rest of our body to keep it running. We have a natural fear of losing blood or our blood clotting. We, we worry about having to take blood thinners and, and losing blood. We know that many times we have to take uh, blood tests. Many of us who uh, feel so-called, give to the Red Cross and, and other organizations during blood drives. And some of us uh, are the beneficiaries of those who have given uh, to those blood drives as we receive transfusions. For many of us, we're scared of blood. We have some sort of visceral reaction. Either we uh, pass out and faint or maybe we uh, uh, throw up. Um, we all have different thoughts and, and approaches and understandings. Particularly for me, when, when I'm getting my blood drawn, uh, I have the habit of watching it uh, to kind of psych myself up so that I know when it's coming and when it's done. Those are all natural human reactions to blood. But in the Bible, blood acts as a witness. It protects the Jews in Egypt during the Passover as the blood of an innocent lamb is painted on the door so that the angel of death would pass over them. Later on, as those same uh, Jews were living in the Promised Land, and the tabernacle was being constructed. God commands Moses and the rest of the priests to wash everything with the blood of the Lamb, that it, would clean, that it would clean it up and it would save them. That same blood shed by the innocent Lamb, metaphorically, that is Jesus, has saved us and those in today's passage in Revelation. We talk a lot about blood. We talk about the blood of Christ particularly when we're celebrating the Last Supper, when we're celebrating uh, communion, and we eat the body and drink the blood, we, we have 
our own ideas about that. Um, particularly if, if I'm serving communion with somebody else and, 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 and there's an option to either uh, have the bread or the cup, I will, if, it's, if it is uh, my own congregation, I will opt to uh, hold on to the cup. Uh, that contains the blood because the blood is uh, Im important. And if I'm a guest assisting a pastor, I will uh, offer to take the body so that they might have uh, the blood knowing that uh, for, for me it is important that they as the pastor are uh, the one uh, to distribute uh, the, the blood or, or the cup uh, because the blood is important. In the Bible, blood is also a symbol for life. To say that we are to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb, or to sing it, uh, as, as we often do, uh, is to say that we steep our worship in the life of the Lamb of God, that is Jesus Christ. This is pure, undefiled worship. This is worship that keeps the chaos at bay and sends us forth renewed and healed, that we might be a force for renewal and healing in our own communities and in the world. It is worship that centers on the life of Jesus Christ and modeling that. So may we be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May we be those saints who in that day will be part of that multitude that John saw in today's passage in Revelation.